Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today it's another prologue video. That, again, the reason I like doing these is I like looking at how authors play with prose, play with their language to do something. And today I'm looking at the prologue to N.K. Jemisin's fifth season, uh, the first book of the, the Broken Earth trilogy. And Jemisin does something absolutely fantastic here. It really is brilliant. Uh, and I'm going to go through, uh, rather than the whole thing, because it is actually, it's quite a long prologue, and it would probably take uh, about two hours to go through it line by line. So I'm going to take a little chunk from the start to talk over some general points, then talk about the movement that uh, Jemison employs uh, fantastically to, to bring us through the prologue. Um, and then just sort of finish off with the, the last paragraph, uh, just to show how it all sort of ties up at the end of the prologue. So uh, I hope you enjoy this. The prologue's entitled, You Are Here. Let's start with the end of the world, why don't we? Get it over with and move on to more interesting things. People talk about good opening lines. And like this, uh, to, to use a, a slightly corny phrase, this is a doozy. Let's start with the end of the world. So the juxtaposition of start and end, obviously uh, nicely put in the middle of this, but the end of the world. We're going to start with the end of the world and then a comma followed by why don't we? And it's suddenly very conversational and the reader is being brought in and being included in this. The narrator is speaking directly to us and including us. So let's start with the end of the world, why don't we? And it's this wonderful, informal, almost chatty, relaxed, and yet that tone seems completely discordant with what is actually being discussed, the end of the world. Let's start with the end of the world, why don't we? Get it over with and move on to more interesting things. What is more interesting than the end of the world? And this you can see with this opening, these two sentences, Jemison sets up a brilliant story, uh, establishes a great tone. There's a fascinating sort of hook for all of this. And it, it's just encapsulated so neatly in those two opening sentences. Then the next paragraph, first, a personal ending. So again, remember I said the, the juxtaposition of start and end, and we're in a prologue and the prologue is talking about the end of the world. So we're doing the end at the beginning. And now the first part, uh, the first paragraph, body paragraph following on from it. First, a personal ending. So again, the juxtaposition of first and end. So we're getting this repetition of theme of um, focus and subject being repeated here. And it's that nice structural thing. The very first sentence starts with the end of the world. The first sentence of the next paragraph starts with a personal ending. So structurally, thematically, tonally, it's all playing so well together, so well enmeshed. There is a thing she will think over and over in the days to come as she imagines how her son died and tries to make sense of something so innately senseless. She will cover Uki's broken little body with a blanket, except his face because he is afraid of the dark and she will sit beside it numb and she will pay no attention to the world that is ending outside. So I just, this is obviously only two sentences. There's a thing she will think over and over in the days to come as she imagines how her son died and tries to make sense of something so innately senseless. This is obviously very devastating news. It's a devastating emotional thing. The idea of dealing with a child's death right at the very beginning of this is, is telling you that this is not a happy story that we're just going to be following. And there's a lot of emotional impact here. But what I like and what I like focused on this is the repetition of a lot of those S signs, uh, the sibilance that runs through this. She imagines how her son died and tries to make sense of something so innately senseless. 
repetition of sense and senseless in that juxtapositional sense. Um, lots of repetitions of that sibilance all the way through. And it just, you can hear the poetic nature of the language. But what then really sells this, what really convinces you as a, a reader, at least I feel, is she will cover Uki's broken little body with a blanket. If it had just been broken body, that would have been bad. And you would have had that nice alliteration of the BB sound. But by breaking it up with the word little, it emphasizes it's a son and it is a child. And then Jemison doubles down on this, except his face because he is afraid of the dark. And that is a heartrending and poignant little piece of information to drop in here. It's not just a mother um, dealing with a child's death and, and covering the body with a blanket. It's remembering that this child had a personality, had a life, had, had dreams, had fears, and was afraid of the dark. And even in death, the mother loves the child so much that she can't bring herself to cover him completely in darkness. And that, and we were warned, first a personal ending. We were warned at the very start of the paragraph that this is what was going to happen. It's a personal ending. And this is so deeply personal. And she will sit beside it numb and she will pay no attention to the world that is ending outside. And with this line, not only do we have a, a very accurate description of grief, of when we find a loved one who is dead, but also the world outside might be ending, but that is irrelevant when it is your child because your world has already ended and this ending in front of you, this personal ending is so much more impactful than a world ending event. That's irrelevant because that's how important this child is, this son is. The world has already ended within her and neither ending is for the first time. And this is, again, sort of consolidating that feeling that we got from this, that we've, we've extracted from the language. The world has already ended within her. So this is making explicit the death of a child ends her world, ends the mother's world, at least metaphorically, if not, you know, physically. But the emotion is there. This is the end of the world emotionally for the, for the woman. And then we get another sentence uh, clause, and neither ending is for the first time. And this this is such a brilliant and curious line. It is a hook for what is going to be developed in this novel. It's a hook for the world and it's a hook for the, the personal story because this neither ending is for the first time implies this is not the first time the world has ended. So something that is described as the end of the world has happened repeatedly, but also this is not the first time that one of her children has died. And that's being implied. She's old hat at this by now. And that phrase at the end, one of the reasons I like that is, if you remember the very opening, I said it was informal. Um, here's a, a nice little idiom thrown in, old hat, but it's very conversational. Uh, it's thrown in, it continues this, what we had looked at in that paragraph, which is so poignant and yet related in everyday language, in very conversational language, using expressions that we readily understand. And it's about the, the emotion of it. It's all in that conversational register. She's old hat at this by now. What she thinks then and thereafter is, but he was free. And that is a great line on its own, that this is hanging there on its own as a, a single paragraph. And that freedom is so important. And yet we know that this freedom has come at the cost of life. It is being free of everything, which is implying that the life that they have lived 
is something that was a prison, that's something that was holding them down, that's something that was um, enslaving them in some ways. And it is only through death that you can become free. And it's that trying to convince yourself of the silver lining to a cloud, trying to convince yourself of look on the bright side of what has happened. It's trying to see the positive in something so tragic. And that is such an understandable emotion and it's so relatable. And it, it's something I think resonates with all of us who have lost loved ones, who have lost people who were in constant pain or people who it, it, the world was too much. And it is so simply stated. None of this is dressed up in deeply poetic metaphor. None of this is made up in a complicated language. And yet Jemison's command of this straightforward conversational tone just drips with this emotion. It is laden with this emotion. And it is her bitter, weary self that answers this almost question every time her bewildered, shocked self manages to produce it. He wasn't, not really, but now he will be. And so what I like about this is setting up the idea of these sort of dual perspectives. We are made up of multiple people, not in the sense of multiple personalities or anything like that, but you know, this is me in work mode. This is me in school mode. This is me in home mode. This is me in, we, we have these different modes of performance. And here we have her better weary self sort of answering her bewildered shock self. So there's part of her in this scene that is shocked at the death of her son. And there's another part of her that is the worn down beaten part of her is kind of responding to the two questions. Now, obviously, there's an aspect of this that plays into the main novel that I'm not getting into. But you can see that, you know, that metaphorical sort of playfulness here. But it even without considering the rest of the novel, you can see how this is communicating that different aspects of ourselves may have different perspectives on things. Um, and, you know, it, it is, it's one of those curious things. You can go, if I was in work mode, I would go, yeah, I agree with that. But because I'm actually in home mode and you know, you're, uh, you're my significant other, of course I agree with you. I'm going to support you. Even though if I was in work mode, I go, no, no, you're wrong. There can be a conflict between our perspectives depending upon the frame of reference that we're applying to them and the, the role or register with which we're contemplating information. Narrative perspective one I like to talk about. But this idea that contradicting he was free with he wasn't, not really, but now he will be. And so we have this movement again, past and, and future being relayed. He wasn't, but now he will be sort of looking at this transition of time and looking at the idea that death is in fact a release in this and the next sentence is so, so important, but you need context. And here it's revealed, yes, it's conversational, and the reader is being included because it's in second person. We are being addressed, but you need context. Let's try the ending again, writ continel, uh, con continently. <laughs> Actually a hard word for me to pronounce, but you need context. So directly addressing the reader, bringing us into the text. Now we understand the conversational tone. This is the narrator speaking to us. This is the narrator having a conversation with us, giving us information. Let's try the ending again, writ continentally. And this is the, the moment of transition that I, I wanted to talk about because what Jemison now does is a textbook example of how to track motion through narrative. Here is a land. So Jemison starts, and it's, I, I won't go through the rest of the, the paragraph here, but she starts with a discussion of the continent. 
she starts with a description of the continent with these large geographical features and then gives it a name, the stillness. And then the next paragraph details it further. It goes deeper into the continent until we travel through this description to the town of Eumenes. And when we get to Eumenes, again, we start at the outlying districts and the mention of the sort of the, the shacks and the favelas around the outskirts of Eumenes. And then we move into the middle of Eumenes and we get to the Black Star. And then once we're in the Black Star, we zoom in again to a man who's on the wall in the Black Star. And then we close in even further to the face of the man. And it kind of pauses there for a while before moving out ever so slightly to encompass the woman standing with the man as a companion. And then there is another transition. We start with the event. And then we are told this originates from the man. It moves from Black Star, from Eumenes, and ripples outwards. And then Jemison zooms all the way out into a planetary view to give you an idea of scale of everything that is going on in terms of how large this event is, which recalls at the very beginning, this is about the end of the world. And then it's uh, she transitions to talking, now that she's in the air, in the sky, looking down on all this, the floating obelisks get taken into the narrative view. And then from there, it moves into a close up again and zooms in to the woman from the very beginning. And we close out the loop. We end where we began. And you can see how Jemison has done this is this wonderful cinematic logical progression of perception after perception, uh, starting out very broadly, zooming in closer and closer and closer and closer until we get to the face of someone and then panning right back out again moving out from the face of the man to the person next to them to the event that the man has created that has a planetary effect rippling outwards from black star through humanes across the continent in order to take that in the planetary view then up because we are up on this high point this high planetary view taking in the floating obelisks and now that we've established all of this and we're floating above it all to zoom back into where we began and you can just imagine that as a tracking shot, as a cinematic sweeping through of all of this information. And you can follow that logic. It is so wonderfully expressed. And it is narrated to us, again, in second person, in a very conversational uh, tone, that someone is filling us in, letting us know all of this information. But it's not done in an artificial way. It's not done in, I'm going to try and hide this exposition. It's, I'm including you because you don't know about this and I'm going to tell you about it. And what was the prologue called? You are here. Like a map, a big map with an arrow on it and a circle that says, you are here. This is what we have. This is what Jemison has framed in this exquisite uh, prologue. So I just want to now look at the very last paragraph that closes all of this out. And I'd like, even if you're not interested in reading the whole book, this prologue is available online as a sample. You can actually just read the prologue and go and read it. But this is how it ends. This is what you must remember. The ending of one story is just the beginning of another. This has happened before, after all. People die, old orders pass, new societies are born. When we say the world has ended, it's usually a lie because the planet is just fine. But this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends for the last time. And this is such a fantastic and powerful way for, for Jemison to close out this prologue because she brings up 
and highlights the very thing that we think of is that we use, we use hyperbola all the time. We talk about, oh, the world is the world is ending. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, what are we going to do? And it can be on a personal level or it can be on a civilization level. But the, the truth remains, the world doesn't end. The world keeps on spinning. It's us that end. It's our civilization that ends. It's our lives that end. That ultimately the planet's just going to keep on going and we'll be gone. Um, and so we're used to this lie, essentially, or, or this hyperbola of discussing the situation, of conflating our own self-importance with the importance of the world. And then she challenges that. But this is the way the world ends. So by raising, because the planet is just fine, and saying that's why this doesn't apply, that's why you, you shouldn't really say this is the world ending, because the planet's always fine, follows it up with, but this is the way the world ends. And the implication here is, no, the, the planet is ending this time. This, this isn't a personal, my life is over, oh, my world has ended. Someone has left me, oh, it's the end of the world. It's not even, oh, the city has been destroyed. It's the end of the world. It's not even, oh, the civilization has been destroyed. It's the end of the world. No, no, no. What is being emphasized here, what is being suggested here is the planet is going to end. And therefore, literally, this is the way the world ends. This is the story of the end of the world, the end of the planet. And then the repetition of those lines, but this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. And then in italics, this is the way the world ends, emphasizing it. And then, as you would say to someone in conversation, the, the little fragment at the end, for the last time. And I think this provides such a fantastic hook for the story. It gives you a sense of the stakes, the personal stakes, the personal story of a woman who's lost a son, the continental and civilization spanning stakes of, you know, we know about this great city, we know about this continent, and then even larger, the planetary scale. These are the stakes at play here. So this is the way the world ends, personal. This is the way the world ends, civilization. This is the way the world ends, the planet. And it's for the last time, promising that this is the important story. This is not just one more, oh, we thought the world was going to end, but no, this is a story of great importance. So I know that was a bit briefer than I usually do, but it genuinely is a very, very long prologue. Um, and I, I really do urge you, if, if you have the opportunity, have a look online and just read that prologue. It, it's a fascinating look at how such a, a simple and straightforward technique, taking that cinematic camera and panning up from a close up at the beginning of a very personal scene with tragedy and poignancy and it's th these harrowing emotions and pulling back from that to give you a sweeping look at the continent to zoom in on the continent and giving you that physical setting and location of the story. And then when something happens, zooming back out again, and then bringing us back to the beginning, you can imagine it all so vividly because it follows this really beautiful, nice, straightforward logic. And because it is relayed in that conversational tone, because it is relayed in a second person narration, the narrator is directly talking to us. It provides that wonderful level of engagement because it's someone telling you a story. It's someone directly addressing you. And then that emphasis at the end, because this is in an informal register, because this is mimicking that sort of almost conversational tone, that repetition really sits and you can imagine someone saying it and the look on your face is yeah whatever and they then repeat and you no I still not and they repeat it again and you start to get it and then they hammer home that last line for the last time to really emphasize it so you can almost imagine all of this so vividly and I think it, 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 Jemison's a fantastic writer um, so I strongly, or I would highly 
uh, recommend looking at the book. But I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you in the next one.